Come on, baby. She's getting older. Um, she's only been to a few of my talks, and I, I get to speak all over the world, and I really feel fortunate, but I never get to bring her, so I thought I'd bring her today. She's been to a few of these, and uh, she'll just lie down and be here with us, but it's... Uh, You'll, you'll see that she's a big part of my life, so I'm glad, glad to have the love of my life with me for this. So, um, so thanks. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, I usually get to talk about wood buildings or get to talk about climate change. That's kind of a big part of who we are as a firm. And today I'm not really going to talk about either of those two things. And um, that actually makes me feel kind of excited. Uh, um, and that comes from, obviously, the theme of today and how... how um, how it's been organized and, uh, and the theme of roots and all of the sort of questions that sit on your chest today um, come from that story. But I thought the way I'd kind of bring us into the conversation is give you a little sort of very personal kind of story and then I'll eventually tell you about some of the buildings we're doing and how it connects, but um, it'll be a while before you see pretty pictures in this talk. So sit tight. Um, so about 12 years ago, I, I got asked to do this really fun talk here in Vancouver that was... Um, it was organized, there was about 20 speakers, and we were all asked to uh, basically answer this question. What one thing would you change to make Vancouver a greater place in the future, to live in the future? And it's a great question, and it was a pretty clever format, and they invited past mayors and city planners, and I think Bruce Hayden was another architect there with me, and, and they said, you have one image in three minutes, which is a really cool challenge. They're like, well, how do you, what, what on earth are you gonna say? And, and you know, I felt like the kid, and I'm always the kind of least, dressed person there in these kinds of formats and all the mayors are kind of looking at me like I don't belong and they go around the room and as they slowly work across the crowd, everybody doing their one image in three minutes, uh, it eventually got to my turn. And when they were going, they, we got answers that you, you might expect. It was sort of, you know, we should add more SkyTrain stations, we should change the planning process, we should build more affordable housing, good things, right? But things that you might expect. And for me, um, I thought a lot about it and how to kind of dig a little deeper in what would make our city a better place. And I came up with this as my one image. And that's an image from Ethiopia of two people greeting each other. And I came up with this image because at the time our firm was working, and we still do, work in um, Central Asia for the Aga Khan, and we work in high mountain cultures, which is kind of near and dear to my heart because I come from a background of climbing. And, and high mountain environments. And so we'd been working in, in mostly in Tajikistan, we've worked in Kyrgyzstan and, and Afghanistan and Pakistan, but the, the work we were doing is in these Muslim communities. And what I found is that every time I walked down the street, people, random strangers, would put their hand on their heart and look at me in the eyes and kind of nod. And that when you met somebody, you put your hand on your heart and you do that. Or when you say goodbye, you put your hand on your heart and you do that. And there's something incredibly warm about the experience of, of that greeting. And then I thought about Ethiopia, and what you do in Ethiopia is you hold hands, you lean in, and you put your head on the other person's shoulder. Even if you don't know them, that's how you greet them. And the longer, the more you know them, the longer you keep your head there. But that intimacy is so contrasting to the way we greet each other on the streets, right? We have a power handshake. If you, if you throw out a kind of weak handshake, you spend the rest of the morning regretting it, feeling like I blew that handshake. So, so you know, we're, we're about sort of this kind of positioning of ourselves, whereas so many other cultures, especially beautiful Muslim cultures, have this kind of warmth to them. And so the answer I gave to the question is, I would change how we say hello. And I actually proposed to the audience, who at this point are looking at me like I was kind of insane because I didn't propose SkyTrain stations, that, <laughs> that um, you know, what I said to them is, you know, at the time our office was here in Gastown, I spent a lot of time in Gastown, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we walked past each other and we all put our hands on our heart and we change just in this neighborhood the way we say hello. And why that matters is as designers, as creatives, I think unless you actually look at other people, if you make that human connection, it's really impossible to solve the problems our city has unless we create a closer bond. But when you put your hand on your heart and you look at a stranger, you're going to actually receive them in a different way and you're gonna think about your job in a different way and you're gonna solve problems in a different way. And so that answer still sort of holds true for me. And I thought it was a good place to kind of riff off for today's theme, Roots. Um, because I think this question um, of what we could do to make our city a better place, or our country or the world a better place, I think is, is rooted in these kind of simple ideas. So um, for me, this, the word Roots, and when, Bruce, when uh, Mark sort of reached out and, and asked 
uh, you know, that I would fill this empty slot that they couldn't find anybody else to show up for. Um, <laughs> and I didn't have to pay too much to be here, but I, you know, I was able to, I was able to convince them I could come. Um, I thought about this word roots a lot, and, and you know, he, he said to me, you know, that roots could go all different directions, obviously, because we're like a wood architecture firm, maybe, you know, it's kind of the tree reference was going to come up, and, and uh, it, it just a lot of ways you could go, but I, I thought about it a lot. I kind of my Zen space is the bathtub. I got in there, and and uh, all of a sudden I'm apologizing that I'm painting this image for you because of the nudist <laughs> camp thing. But it's where I think, and I really thought to myself that for me, roots is actually a huge driver of my life, my career, my creative creativity, and my and my loves. And it's it's actually deeply part of who I am. And, and it made me think a lot about sort of um, how I could tell, how I could explain that in a quick way. And in 2013, I had this amazing opportunity given to me, really related around these wood buildings we were doing and this concept that, that we came up with to build the world's tallest wood buildings and how that would help climate. And so Technology Education Design, which is TED, in 2013 invited me to go down to Long Beach and give this talk, which was super cool, but also super scary um, because it's a big audience. And I'm actually and I don't, a lot of my friends don't really see this in me. I'm like a super-sized, shy person. I don't actually, I, it's work for me to put myself out there. And all of a sudden, I had to get on stage. And when you get on the main stage at TED, it, you know, literally I had Bill Gates in the front row. And I, I just climbed up on stage, just terrified. I brought my sister as my plus one to kind of calm me down. And, and, uh, and I stood there, and there's Bill Gates, and Elon Musk is in the audience. And, and I look over, and there's Paul Simon in the back, like one, one of you guys, and with his, with his wife, Edie Burkell. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Paul Simon. And then I look over here, and, and it was Jim Carrey. And he, and he looked at me and made one of those weird Jim Carrey faces. And I was like, don't look at the audience. But I had designed the talk very purposefully around what would help me. So I created a, a, a simple device in my talk, and if you've ever seen my talk or if you go and watch it now, the first words, and I, I couldn't tell you anything else I said, but I can tell you these words were what I said in the very beginning, which is this is my grandfather and this is my son. And I use those words for two really important reasons. One is that by just saying those two people in my life, these two really profoundly important people in my life, it would calm me down it would get me ready to begin the talk. And, you know, would also become a theme, and it would, in doing so and calming me down, it was because those two people are grounding for me. So the answer on your, on your badges is related to this conversation. And grounding for me is because my grandfather was a person in my life um, that taught me a whole bunch of things. He taught me about nature and craft. He was an amazing historian. He was actually the president of the American Historical Society. And he taught me about climbing in the mountains. And so that list I could make go on forever. But those things that he taught me profoundly changed me as a young person and, and stuck with me throughout and stick with me throughout my life today. And he also taught me about the idea of honoring the tree and the man and the conviction and the work and the deep work and what we do. And so my grandfather is my roots. He is my past. The stories he told me about the generations before him were the feed and the, and the energy that I needed as a young person to define who I would become. Those are my roots. So he was giving me ultimately these gifts, as you hope generations before you will do. For my son, who was, I guess, about at that time, maybe 10 or 11 years old, he, together with my daughter, who's a little younger, Elsa, um, my son's name is Makalu, after the fifth tallest mountain in the world, good trivia. Um, and, uh, but they, they really you know, have taught me this it, and, and made me understand what it really means to feel deep love and passion, drive, conviction, and responsibility, and a whole bunch of other things. And so this parody of both a generation before me, my roots, and the generation beyond me, my children, are so defining in who I am and, the, and what I want to bring to the creativity I live with that my kids have given me my purpose. And of course I had purpose beforehand, but your purpose is what every day wakes you up and actually takes you from you know, treating your life as a job or treating your life as an experience to actually creating a mission that drives your decisions every time you have an opportunity. 
So together, my kids and my grandfather are my heroes. These are the people that I list. And the idea of heroes is something I think is really important. If I came back for some other talk, I'd love to just talk about the idea, the notion of heroes. And I have many heroes, but, but the idea that your family, your roots are your heroes is important. So over time, like I think in life, we all gather really cool quotes that we like and drivers in our lives. Um, and we create these mantras, say it's sayings that we say to ourselves that kind of charge us up. And so in our family and, and with my kids, we've developed a whole bunch of them. And one of the things we, my kids and I like to do is a ton of climbing. We like bushwhacking, getting into the thick bush and your legs get all scratched up and your arms get all scratched up. And so with them, we created our little family slogan, slogan which is he who dies with the most scars wins. <laughs> And the best part about it is for my kids, since they were little, little kids, they literally would get bumped and scraped and they would get up and be like, I'm winning, this is great, <laughs> and, and compete. You know, I'd tell them I fell off some ice climb and they'd be like, damn it, you're pulling ahead. Um, so, the, the, you know, and obviously means much more than the physical, right? But the, that saying was important to me and I think it, it comes from these other sayings that I put in my life and actually this one, which I write in the foreword of every book I write, um, so I, I've written a bunch of children's books, I've written a bunch of technical books, and I've written some, and I'm writing some things that are, uh, you know, both nonfiction and fiction, and, and, and I love writing. But the first thing I always say is this, it's every parent's job to tell their kids they can change the world, but first it's our job to show them how. And that belief, which is rooted in the stories my grandfather told me, um, has become the belief that I, of course, want to show my kids what we can do to make the world a better place. And so there was a Q&A that Mark gave us to, before this, this talk, and I kind of reframed it in, in, a, in another way, which is the biggest challenge to solving the world's greatest plot problems is the assumption that someone else will do it first. And I think the more I say that to myself every day, the more I realize that we just keep stepping up into things that maybe we don't really feel like doing, we're kind of too busy to do, but no one else is going to do it, and we better do it, because the world has some major challenges ahead, and we have to start thinking about solving them. So those shape my purpose. Everybody here hopefully has a foundational roots of their purpose. Those are the foundational roots of my purpose. I want to make the world a better place, and purpose is going to shape my practice. So finally, the tree that was going to inevitably show up in this talk because of the roots thing. So. Um, <laughs> So, and if you don't know that image, that's Bruno Minari, who's an amazing graphic artist from the mid-century in, in Italy and wrote a whole series of children's books. This one is called How to Draw a Tree. Um, I collect them all and they're amazing, go find them. Um, but, it, but it, you know, I put this up here because there's this other concept, which is a Greek proverb that we use in our practice a lot in the way we think, and of course we do build in wood, but this proverb is, old men plant seeds for trees whose shade they shall never receive. Again, as a designer, our job is not to just think for the immediate context of what we are designing, but what this will do for generations to come. Will this design last beyond us? And as an architect, that is the privilege of being an architect. If I build something well, if I build something absent of fashion and instead with integrity and meaning and depth and purpose and a legacy concept in mind, it will last for generations. That is a privilege and it is my duty to make sure everything I build has that same legacy to it. So roots matter ultimately, and I think this idea of roots can be taken in all different ways, as Mark had said to me in the beginning. And If you have, are a designer here, a landscape architect, an architect, or just a good gardener, you might know that tree roots basically are essential to the health of the tree above the ground, and there's a simple rule that the drip line, the edge of that tree above, basically reflects roughly the scale of the roots below. Depends on the type of tree, but that's a good rule of thumb. So when we know when we're building a building not to drive too close to a tree, we fence off trees around their drip line because we want to protect the tree. And the deeper the roots are, obviously, the healthier the tree becomes. And so we want to constantly um, protect those roots and the depth of those roots. So in 1930, my great-grandfather, uh, had this amazing opportunity in upstate New York, in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York, to buy a piece of land because the Brazilian ambassador was fleeing in a coup and was basically unloading this piece of land called, that we call Cannon Point. And I don't know what his process was at the time, but it's, it was an old, it's called Cannon Point because it's an old British 
camp that was used during the Revolutionary War and again in the War of 1812, and it's falling apart, and I spent every summer just trying to put it back together because of all the rot. But he had this foresight to create something at that point that he probably didn't know would ultimately impact generation after generation of my family, great-grandchildren. He was my great-grandfather and all of the cousins and all of these people that got to enjoy this place and feel more connected to the land just because he made the simple decision of buying something at that time and thinking about legacy and his choices. And so I've had the good fortune just in the last couple of years to buy a property on Salt Spring and my mission was the same. I want, I felt like I've had this opportunity to be able to afford to buy this property. I want to buy something for my great grandchildren for the shade that I will never receive. And I want to build something for my great grandchildren for the shade that I'll never receive. And when I bought the property, we pretty quickly, I'm an architect, so I wanted to design all this stuff. I'm going to move actually my not for profit schools design build program over there. So we'll have classes and, and camping and all this sort of stuff on the property. But I need to first put in a septic system. And the septic system has to. Um, uh, you know, go in an area where I have to build a little road to get to the septic system. So my contractor said, you know, I've got all this soil, I'm gonna put it in really quickly and that'll build up the road. And I said, sure. And so there's a hill, the road, the ocean down here. And what he did was he put in all that soil and what we didn't anticipate is last fall, there were a lot of rains, the water came down that hillside, it saturated that soil and held on to all that water instead of letting it dissipate into the ocean. And last Christmas time, a big windstorm hit here, but it really hit Salt Spring, and this huge tree basically ripped its roots out and fell to the ground. And when it ripped the roots out, uh, it did so basically because of my mistake. I hadn't learned about this property. I hadn't respected the water flow of the property. I hadn't rooted myself in this new place enough to understand the repercussions of my decisions. And those mistakes are made every day by all of us, but we have to learn from those kinds of mistakes. The deeper the roots, the healthier the tree, the more you root yourself in place, the longer it lasts. So when it comes to what one thing I would today change, it's still to how do we say hello, and I do expect you all to put your hand on your heart if you see me on the streets here, and I'll do the same. <laughs> um, but basically, it's to deepen our roots by design. We need to deepen our roots. So Roots is about legacy before and after, and it's about fundamentally good design. Now the word good design is something you'll hear all the time, and it doesn't have a definition, and it means something different to all of us, and it should. But for me, what good design is, it's not the look of something created, but rather the meaning, the legacy, and the purpose. I think far too much of the public conversation about design is just how things look. Making things beautiful, I think, is easy. Making things meaningful, that's hard work. Making things last, that's hard work. That's the important work. And unfortunately, you know, it's challenged by a society that's ultimately creating shallower and shallower roots. And by example of that, what I mean is, and this is a fun fact that's not so fun, which is that Americans move on average 11.7 times in their life. And when I did the research, I had our time coming up with the Canadian statistic for this, but it's roughly nine times for Canadians that we're going to move, which means on average, we're moving houses every eight years. More often when we're young, a little less often in the Middle Ages, and again, when we're old, we do it a few more times. And there are good reasons to move, but right now in society, people change their homes, their furniture, their wardrobes, their jobs, and their relationships at this incredibly fast pace, much faster than generations before us. Our roots are shallow. And what that starts to look like is this sort of this reality that we're barraged by this kind of impermanence in our lives. And I totally made up this next statistic. <laughs> On average, Americans will own six <laughs> dining room tables. <laughs> so your first one, you just got your college, you know, like apartment, and you found the table at the at the dumpster down the block. Then it kind of gets a little rickety. You go out to IKEA, you buy your next one for your next apartment, and then it's not quite big enough, so you go get another IKEA one at your next apartment, and eventually maybe you pick up one that's a hand-me-down from a, a relative. But we go through dining room tables like no tomorrow. That's, that's it, thank you. <laughs> that's not the point of my talk. So, so um, we go through dining room tables and, and, and the problem clearly is that we're not creating permanence. 
by design. We're not creating permanence. We actually have companies slated to make cheap furniture so that we can afford it at certain age groups and throw it away and move on to the next thing. Well, that's a choice we make as society. We can make great furniture that costs less as well, right? But we don't do that. So when I was about 20, 21, I got, I, I, I like building furniture and I designed and, and made this table for a dining room table, my first one. And uh, my first of six, by the way. Um, so when I made the table, it was, it was, it, you know, it was probably 12 years before, it was more, 14 years before I even had children. And, uh, and I was building this table, and I remember thinking really carefully about the construction, the wood joinery, how I would build this dining room table. And one of the things that became really deeply important to me, even at 22, was that I knew that the joinery that you would only see in this table from below would only be seen by my own children someday, long in the future. And that was important to me. I wanted to lie on the, on the floor with my kids and tell them the story of the choices I made that only they would know. Because someday I want to hand them that dining room table and I want them to hand that to their children and so on and so forth. And I want the story as they sit around that table with their friends to be the story about the thing you can't see. The quality that their dad had made or their grandfather had made or their great grandfather had made only for them. Those stories, that meaning that we embed in the choices we make as designers are important. Those are the ways we turn things from objects into heirlooms. And if we don't start doing that, we are going to continue this very shallow, rooted, and very uh, transitional and very wasteful society that we live in. And as designers, we can change that. So obviously, what if we only own one dining room table handed from generation to generation? What would the world look like? So with deeper roots, we buy less, we invest more, we think generationally, and we become more connected and more grounded. So. Um, you know, ultimately impermanence is really killing us. Sustainability is a conversation you can have from so many different angles. You know, we talk a ton about embodied carbon and why buildings have to be built in wood. We're really screwed. I could go on forever and tell you a whole bunch of nightmare stories about how bad the actual climate crisis is. But I think a big part of it is this, is that we don't care enough. We design buildings that are fashionable, not buildings that last for generations. We're trying so hard as designers to get on the front page of magazines or to win awards by creating celebrity things. We forget that the buildings that are anonymous are the buildings that last for generations, the buildings that are quiet, that have integrity and have meaning. So the deeper our roots, the more we become driven by our purpose and the less we become distracted. So um, I'm going to run out of time real quick here, right? What, who's got my clock? I'm out of time. Well, here you go. There's the whole, th I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a couple of really fast slides because I think it's important. So, so the thing is a firm, right? So you didn't even get to see our work, which is awesome. It's great to do a talk about creativity with no visuals, but um, this is City Hall in North End. So I run MGA, the architecture firm. Uh, I founded something called DBR, Design Build Research, a long time ago, which is a not-for-profit. Dorian here is, and I don't know if Fernandez here, we have a few people from DBR here as well. That runs a whole bunch of different programs. One is that we do design build projects. We did them initially for the TED conferences. Uh, we still do. And, um, and then we created something we call Timber Online Education, which is trying to take all this work we're doing with wood buildings and, and actually change the entire global construction system, which is an insane goal but really important. So we're trying to create 500 courses for the entire construction marketplace, design architecture, uh, building developers, policymakers, courses that will basically transform from the way they currently think into a much more climate sensitive way of thinking. That's the purpose. That's the story that I told you before, rooted from the stories my grandfather gave me and mission to solve problems that my kids need me to solve. So this program TOE, which we're doing, will be free education online, translated into 35 different languages and given to the world, hopefully over the next block of five years or so, such that we can actually take this industry, the 40% of global climate impact that comes from our industry as designers, as architects, and actually make this change happen quickly because we are running out of time. So we're doing those things through DBR and we're just gonna, I'm gonna give you two more things, we're three more things we're doing with DBR really quick so I'll get off stage, Mark. And, uh, one of them is that we, um, through DBR, we're going to run a competition for something that's part of our roots here in Vancouver. Uh, 48 years ago, 
48 and a half years ago, Greenpeace started here in our city. So we partnered with Greenpeace. We've run a bunch of competitions through DBR. We often partner with the United Nations when we do that. In this case, we partnered with Greenpeace and we will hopefully bring the United Nations into it to create a global competi competition that has three pieces to it. One is ideas from children about telling the story of Greenpeace and the environmental movement. One is for artists to actually do an installation here in Vancouver for an opening that's gonna happen in October of 2021. And the other is we partner with the Vancouver Art Gallery and we'll be doing a space of some sort, a competition for a space that also tells the story of Greenpeace and its origin story here in our city. We are at this turning point in time, right? We, with Greta and others and the fires in Australia right now, we are all creating a great awareness of the problem. And so we want the storytelling to happen and our city has roots here. We, we talk about being the greenest city in the world. It's bullshit, we're not even close. It's disgraceful. We, and, and there's nobody else that has to solve the problem other than ourselves. No one's gonna fix it. So if you're an architect in the room, we have to step up. If you're not an architect in the room, you have to ask for more. Green only comes from us, it's not gonna come from City Hall. And we have to drive it, which we can, and we can do it if we tell the story of our origin. So um, the last thing I'm gonna mention about what DBR is up to is something that I can't even remember what I was gonna say, so I'm gonna jump here. Watch the pretty pictures, because <laughs> I literally have to go to the back. There's a bunch of wood buildings, wood buildings, wood buildings that save massive amounts of carbon, wood buildings that take, this is a cool stat, that building, North American forest grows enough wood every four minutes to build that building. It's a cool statistic. And that building is 88% less carbon than a traditional building just by choosing wood. Anyway, more buildings, <laughs> more buildings. This is Ron McDonald House, probably my favorite project of my lifetime at Children's Hospital. More buildings. This is on top of Whistler. This is in Baffin Island, first Inuktitut language center in the world, which is where I was born in the Canadian Arctic, so important to me. This is in Sweden, in Minneapolis, first tall wood building in the United States. That's on Sixth Avenue. This is in Paris. More buildings. <laughs> this is for Google. Can't show you anymore, but we're doing super cool stuff with Google right now. And this is main campus in Silicon Valley. This is in Toronto with a Google company called Sidewalk Labs, world's tallest wood building. Uh, more, more wood. Okay, DBR. So these are the, this is what I want to say. So the competition piece, Timber Online. Oh, this is what it was. And this is my last slide, and I'll get off. Um, <coughs> who is it? Archi any architects in the room right now? Who are the architects? Oh, thank you guys. Um, so if you don't know, if you're not an architect, so one of the highest aspirations in our profession is the Pritzker Prize. The Pritzker is like our Nobel Prize for architecture. And I've always been super disappointed that the, no, the people that win the Pritzker, who are brilliant architects doing beautiful work, rarely step up and then represent the profession afterwards. They rarely sort of say as a profession, here's why we matter, here's what we have to do to do a better job for the world, here's how we can do a better job for the world. And it's kind of unfortunate, but it's really not what the award's designed for. It's kind of a lifetime achievement award for beautiful things. And, and these guys all deserve it. It's, it's fair enough that, that these awards have been given, but it's always kind of broken my heart that it doesn't actually deal with what I think good architecture is about, which is about humanity and planet. So we're in the process, and this is a sneak preview, and hopefully we'll launch this when we do this huge event in the city for Greenpeace. But we're building a global award program for planet and humanity that will hopefully have, it will have the cash kind of value of a Pritzker, and therefore we hope to be able to build it on a world scale like the Pritzker. Because then generations that follow aren't aiming for the Pritzker, which is, you know, certainly a fine aspiration. They're aiming for something that actually will make the world a better place and that we're judging architecture based on whether it in fact delivered on that message. So um, sit tight, look for our competition on Greenpeace um, because it is something important to our roots here in the city. And, um, and then look for this as well and we appreciate your support because these are all homegrown, rooted in Vancouver stories. So that's it, thanks. Any questions? No questions. No questions. Are there questions?
Hey, Michael. Uh, fantastic talk. I know we know each other outside of uh, mm -hmm. this space, but just to the local challenge of um, inspiring the use of mass timber, what do you think we could be doing more? Um, like, what can the city of Vancouver do? What can British Columbia do? I, I just remember a little while ago there was um, the municipal meetings at the convention center, and all the lumber trucks showed mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. and they're honking their horns, and there's mills closing locally. Uh, in, Van in the province, what are your thoughts on how things, you know, how, how we can maybe better utilize uh, local resources? Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the right answer. Local resources. So, so our roots, and, and I think this is a really interesting, important thing, and it kind of relates to the politics of our time in North America, is that there is an increasing divide between those that live in cities and those that don't live in cities. And our res we're a resource-based province. Um, you know, timber is an important part of our province. When I talk about these timber buildings all over the world, I'm often talking in places where it isn't a local resource and it's still important. For us, it's even that much more important. Strengthening our rural communities is really important. Creating jobs in our rural communities is really important. And those of us in the city make choices every day that impact their lives. Um, and that has created a political divide that shouldn't exist. We're all one people, we all share the same roots. and, and um, so I think in BC, more than anywhere on the planet, we should be really focused on moving towards an all-wood city. Um, our city's, you know, got a lot of, forgive me, really ugly buildings. We, we, um, we don't have a lot of architecture in our city. And it, it comes from the fact that we've been cranking it out. We've been cranking out a fair amount of impermanence in our buildings. Um, and a move to wood, which roots us again, puts us in a place, um, is important from a roots point of view, and it's really, really important from a climate point of view. One of the things we can all do is advocate in the city of, for the city of Vancouver's got a climate policy that's really, really important to have it enacted, and that's got a six sort of platforms as part of a carb, the carbon policy, and you know, they're traditional things you would expect, like more public transit, um, but one of the, one of the six is, um, is actually a massive decrease in, in embodied carbon. And embodied carbon is what buildings are made out of, it largely. And the current proposal is a 40% reduction in embodied carbon. If that passes in the city of Vancouver, our entire skyline becomes wood buildings overnight. Because the only way you can build a carbon neutral building from an embodied point of view is to use wood. And that is, again, mission critical. Um, in the absence of another, you, there's a question in the back. What, what percentage <coughs> The structure, so it needs to be enough. I mean, it, there's, it depends on the type of building, but if you think about it, everything we make on Earth, we make on Earth, has a carbon footprint. There is no such thing as a truly sustainable building unless it's you know Earth and dug into the ground and has nothing else as part of it. But glass, steel, aluminum, these are, especially aluminum, huge high carbon footprints because they take so much energy to produce. Wood, if you don't know the story, basically when a tree grows, it's giving us oxygen, it's soaking up carbon dioxide. When you take that tree, that wood from that tree, and put it into a building, you're storing the carbon that's stored in that wood for the life of the building. The two things we do to fight climate change are reduce our emissions, so choosing wood instead of steel or concrete, which are high emissions, um, is already that step. And the second is we store. So it doesn't matter what industry on earth we're trying to fix when it comes to climate, it's use less uh, energy and store carbon. So wood does both those things in your buildings and basically when you put it in the building, you get this carbon sink that then offsets the glass, the aluminum and all the things that add up. So the more wood you put in there, the more carbon neutral you are. So that example I gave where we're 88% less than a conventional building, um, we, can, we can be better. We just have a building in, in um, in Spokane, Washington, where we're basically 100% better. Um, we are basically zero carbon, so we're, we're, we're completely clean because we've used enough wood. Um, there's, there's a flip side to that. This is a good story and solution for today. It's not a good story and solution for the long term. We need our forests to be sustainable too. We need forestry as a, the forests themselves are a huge sink for carbon. So it's a, it's a complicated story. But for now, it's the best solution we have to deal with this basically one decade chance we have at actually addressing it. If you don't know the statistic, it's six, the Canadian government has published that we in Canada are going to see a six to 10 degree centigrade rise over the next century. Six to 10 centigrade rise over the next century. We will be hit worse than any other country on earth. 
And it's basically because we have the Arctic, where I'm from originally, which was this massive reflector. Snow is not there, no longer a reflector. It basically means that we're going to have much greater heat in the north. We're going to get forest fires like Australia. So this next decade means we have to make a profound change in the way we build. Um, and this wood story is not only homegrown to Vancouver, something we should globally be proud of, the fact that we invented this here, that the strongest industry in the world for it is here, but also that we should build our entire skyline this way now. So that comes from all of us demanding it, as well as public policy that we can all vote for. Okay, question back there. Here. Thank you. Hi. Um, will the hemp plant become more and more important as a structural building um, material? So, so it is a good material, um, as our mushrooms are. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of grown materials that are really good and have good carbon stories to them. The issue is mass, how much mass you can create. So I think, um, you know, I think the, the big sort of revolution that's going to happen in the next decade, and we're, we're starting to work on this with our firm too, just starting to, is, is basically what's happening in the food industry. So, you know, big story on climate is also the fact that we have huge grazing land. So if you eat meat, we, we don't, we serve vegetarian food in our firm for a reason to be consistent with our carbon story. But if you eat meat, basically meat comes from these big grazing lands that are a huge part of our, our problem from a climate point of view. The food industry is starting to create these alternative meat solutions. And what's most interesting about them is they're pea proteins fed to single cell organisms that can grow these alternative meat sources in basically a vat. And why that's going to be a profound change to our entire diet over the next decade is the fact that even the big food giants, the Crafts and Procter & Gamble, these kind of companies recognize that they can have a vat this big that grows enough meat that would take thousands of acres of grazing land. That they're doing it because it's way cheaper for them to produce food in a vat than by having thousands of acres. But the important part is we can reforest those thousands of acres. And that's the food industry changing like that is probably a clue of where the building industry will change next. So I expect single cell organisms growth to be part of the building material industry within a decade. Okay. It's already 10.04, so I want to make sure everyone gets out of here at time. I've got, I want to give two questions. So who's the only one here? So our group was talking about roots and, and the shift from, you know, impermanence to more permanence and how roots are a big part of that. But for people that don't have, say, roots in their family or children, do you think that's part of the problem or do you think there's no because I think you know I I use my story which does come from my my grandfather and my kids um, but weirdly I, you know I felt this way even before I had my children I was still deciding the table for whoever would be under it I think um, I think um, I think this gathering this group these kinds of activities the kind of activities that were just talked about um, cultural activities that bring us all together, these are roots, right? This is, this is what roots is about. And you can seek that inspiration from your own life story. You can seek that inf inspiration from the circles and friends around you and from the gatherings like this. These are our roots. The more we do this to each other, the more deeply our roots embed in this place. And the more of these events, and I have a huge shout out to Mark and his team, that these kinds of roots fundamentally are changing um, the way we're going to feel about our community. And, and we sh we're very lucky that these things happen. But dig deep into this is the answer. All right, okay. last question. No questions? One more. No, we got one back? Okay. So I want to riff on the roots question. Are you familiar with the uh, ship of Theseus? Um, theorem. It's a Greek idea of a, a wooden ship being built and being repaired over years and years. And, and the question is, after 50 years, every frame on the ship's been replaced. Is it still the same? Does, it, does its name still apply? Is it still the same ship? And so my question is, with when you're thinking of uh, buildings and cities and communities, are, um, and you mentioned that we have some really poor design in our buildings. Can, our, can, these, can we salvage the poor? And, and uh, what are your thoughts on, on sort of uh, yeah. adaptability over the future with yeah. living with what we've got? 
we need to live with what we've got. We need to stop tearing down buildings. We need to actually honor the fact that they're here and we can make them better. And we make them better often not just with the physical look of the building, but how we engage the building, how we add layers of art and, the, and, and bring personality and roots into the story of the existing infrastructure that's here. A lot of people ask me this question about the durability of, of tall wood buildings. It's a common question I get. And the story I often tell is that, you know, some of the tallest wood buildings in the world to this day are temples built in Japan and China that, you know, have existed for 15, 1600 years and more. Those buildings have actually been built, rebuilt over and over and over, just like that story you just told. That love is the roots, right? That is the preservation and that story that the, when you build something that people cherish, they will protect it. They will share the experience of protecting it. Um, and that's why it matters so much, right? So I think it's a great reference point. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Give him a <laughs>